Your very first decision you have to make when creating a new file is which farm you'll be playing on. While the choice isn't as impactful as it used to be due to the second farm you get later on in the game, it's still what you're going to be working with for a year or two in-game. Choosing one can leave you thinking about what you're missing with the others, so I'm going to go over all of them so that you can make an informed decision the next time you make a farm. While I explain each of these farms, I'm going to be walking around so that you can get a good idea of what it'll be like when you actually play on it. Also, I originally was going to clear off all the space so that you could get a good idea of what it looks like empty, but then you wouldn't know what it looks like to clear it off, and some farms have special features when it comes to debris. First thing to point out, each farm is going to have a different style house whenever you start the game. All of the furniture pieces you start out with can be gotten from other means, so you're never locked out from getting anything. So first, the standard farm. Let's get this out of the way. This is the best farm in the game. There are 3,427 spaces that you can use to farm on, more than any other map. But at the same time, this farm doesn't have anything special about it. It's up to you to decorate it to the way you want it to be. And that pretty much is where it shines. You can build buildings wherever, put paths wherever, and make it look exactly how you want it to look. There's a couple of ponds littered about, and they're mostly for refilling your watering can. If you try to fish in them, you'll catch nothing but trash. It's the white bread of farms, the default choice, and the only choice before version 1.1. This is the most popular farm in the game for a good reason. Now, normally at the end of here, I was going to explain whether or not the farm would be good for beginners, but honestly, I think I've come to believe that all farms are good for everyone. It just depends on what way you would like to play. There isn't a farm out there that's just going to be overwhelmingly hard to play on. And I'll go more in depth on that when we get to the farms that people believe are difficult. Next up is the Riverland Farm. I'm a particular fan of the inside of your house. Once again, everything here can be gotten through other means. This farm has the second least amount of farmable spaces at 1,578. There's a huge river flowing through the middle of the farm, and you can only get from island to island on these small planks connecting each island. Luckily, the vertical planks are too wide, so if you are using a horse, you can go on them. There's one exception, the plank leading up to Grandpa's Shrine is one wide, therefore you can't go on it with the horse. Personally, I would say that this is the hardest farm to use. You cannot build on the river at all, so your buildings are going to be taking up valuable space that could be used for farming instead. All of the farmable spaces are broken up onto these small islands. If you want to have a huge single plot of crops, it's not going to happen here. So then, what are the upsides? You can fish in the river. 70% of the time, it'll act like you're fishing in the Pelican Town River, and 30% of the time, it'll be like the Cindersap Forest Pond. So this is one of the places you can fish with the widest variety of fish, although if you're looking for something specific, it won't be very good for that. But being able to fish on your pond is surprisingly useful. If you have any extra time at the end of the day or aren't sure what to do, you can just quickly cast a few lines to make a little extra money. Of course, it's also an absolute haven for crab pots. I had a challenge run where I pretty much made most of my money from crab pots, and it did surprisingly well. I still made a million gold in a hundred days. And if you recycle all of the trash that comes out of the crab pots, they're a decent source of materials like coal and refined quartz. Next, we have the Forest Farm, a very green decorated interior. This is the farm that was added in 1.1, focused on foraging. Now, while this farm has the least amount of farmable spaces at 1,430, they're not as split up as the Riverland Farm. You can see there's a huge plot here that you can use for any crops you need. And the non-tillable spots are grass. While it can't be tilled, it can still be built on, walked on, and decorated. So in the end, this map is much better for farming than the Riverland farm. And that's all of the cons, I guess, so here's the pros. The first thing that jumps out, on the left side of the farm, you'll notice four hardwood stumps separated from everything else. And there's actually two patches of these, one above the other. These will regenerate every day, giving you a constant source of hardwood. And these can be broken once you get the copper axe, just like any other hardwood stump. While walking around, you may find interesting looking pieces of fiber. These will always drop to mix seeds when you cut them. 
There's not a ton of them sitting around, but it does give you a few more mixed seeds than usual. These pieces of fiber are exclusive to this type of farm, you will not find it anywhere else. You also might notice forageables spawning on your farm. This is another unique feature of the forest farm. Usually what'll spawn will be the basic forageables of the season that can be turned into wild seeds, but there are a few standouts. In spring, you can find morels, which are normally only found in the secret woods in spring, which is really hard to get to in your first year, so it's almost an exclusive year one item. In summer, you can find common mushrooms, notably normally a fall forageable, and in fall, you can find all mushroom types other than morels, making good ingredients for life elixirs and otherwise selling for quite a lot. As a little cherry on top, you can fish up cinder sap forest fish in the ponds around the farm, as well as a chance for the wood skip, which is normally limited to the secret woods. Although you do have a 50% chance of fishing up trash here, so I wouldn't recommend fishing for an extended amount of time. All of this adds up to it being one of the most popular types of farms. It has way more benefits than cons, and it looks pretty, with leaves and foliage covering the edges instead of cliffs. Now I'd like to think that the hilltop farm is the stinky brother of the Riverland farm. It's for rugged miners, as you can tell from the decoration. Similar to the Riverland farm, there's not a ton of farming space at just 1,648 tiles, and it's broken up by cliffs and a river that cuts straight through the middle of the farm. It can be really difficult to decide where to put things like coops and barns because there's just not a lot of land for grazing. The special feature of this farm is a patch of dirt at the bottom left, and depending on your seed, there's usually a log, hardwood stump, or boulder blocking the path, but I seem to have gotten really lucky, and I can access it immediately. Once you do deal with whatever's blocking the way, you can find stones, ore nodes, and geode nodes here. This is the only place in the game you'll ever find any geonodes other than omni geode nodes, so it's a pretty big benefit of having this farm. This area upgrades as you get your mining level up, so you'll start to see iron nodes, gold nodes, and then iridium nodes, as well as frozen geode nodes and then magma geode nodes. And you can still build here if you want, if you don't care too much about the mining space. It's also worth mentioning that hardwood stumps and boulders will likely block one of your paths across the river, which means you only have one way to get to an entire half of your farm. Like the forest farm, even though it's not the main point of the map, you can fish in the river. 50% of the time you'll get cinder sap river fish, and the other 50% you'll only find trash. Cool for novelty's sake, but not recommended for heavy fishing trips. This is probably the least used farm of them all, and I can see why. It's difficult to navigate. I am once again blocked by this boulder, and it doesn't really allow you a ton of freedom on how you design your farm. But for those who want a weird layout, this will do it for you. Or if you just want a little bit of extra challenge, it'll do that for you too. So the Wilderness Farm was the last farm added in version 1.1, and nowadays it kind of sits in a weird spot. See, up until version 1.5, there weren't advanced game options, which allow you to check or uncheck spawning monsters on the farm. And that's what this farm used to be the only one able to do. So as of version 1.5, it's lost a little bit of the uniqueness that it used to have. It is still a pretty unique farm though. It has a ton of open space for farming, a respectable 2,131 spaces, and it's all completely uninterrupted save for one pond in the middle of the farm. There's also a big pond in the bottom left, and you can fish in either pond for mountain lake fish 35% of the time, and it's the only farm map to do so. But you will get trash 65% of the time, making it a pretty poor place to fish. It's still good for crab pots though. Now, if you did want to live the classic wilderness farm experience, every night after 8 p.m., monsters will start to spawn and attack you. It starts with basic monsters like bats, but as you start to level up combat, you'll start to see things like iridium slimes and serpents. So it's not for the faint of heart. And monsters will start to spawn on day one before you even have access to any kind of weapon. Now there is one big upside. You get exclusive access to the wilderness golem enemy. Most notably, it has a 1 in 10,000 chance to drop the rare living hat, which is only otherwise found in a 1 in 100,000 chance when cutting fiber. 
It's also worth mentioning that if you ever want to turn enemies on or off after starting your file, you can do it in the witch's hut by donating a strange bun. I do think that this farm has a lot of value. It's almost like a standard farm too, with just a bit of a different layout. Not a lot of people run with this farm because it's not full of features, but it doesn't have to be, as shown from the popularity of the standard farm. The next farm to be added was in version 1.4, the Four Corners farm. It was intended to be used for multiplayer, but can still be used in single player. The farm is divided by four huge cliffs that divide the farm into four sections and each section represents one of the farms that we previously went over. If you're playing on multiplayer, by default, each person's cabin will be on a different section. The top right, where the player's house is, represents the standard farm. There's nothing unique here, but there's a ton of open space for farming, more so than the other plots. And also, each section comes with a small bit of water so that you can refill your watering can. The top left represents the forest farm. There's one hardwood stump that replenishes every day, and it's the only section of the farm where you can find those fiber pieces that always give you mixed seeds. The bottom left represents the Riverland farm, kind of. It's the same as the other sections, except there's a large pond at the bottom. Unfortunately, it only has a 50% chance of giving you a fish from the Cindersap forest pond, and 50% trash otherwise. The bottom right section is what most players would probably call the best section, because at the bottom it has the same little mini quarry that the hilltop farm has. Without all the downsides of having your space mixed up by a river and cliffs. This little quarry notably works off of player 1's mining level, so as they level up in mining, you'll get better items down here. In the center area, you can find the greenhouse alongside the farm cave. And in the middle of all of the cliffs, you can find a shortcut that is blocked by boulders, fallen logs, and stumps. So you'll have to clear that out of the way if you want to get through. This farm is actually surprisingly popular. Although I guess maybe it is because it's the only multiplayer map in the entire game. And lastly, we have the beach farm. This is the last farm that was added to the game in version 1.5. So the intention for this farm was that it's supposed to be a more challenging farm for players playing the game for a second time. And you'll notice, instead of dirt, we have sand. The only difference with sand to dirt is that you can't place sprinklers on it. And sand is what makes up most of the 2,700 tillable spots. There is one small plot of 202 spots that can be sprinkled, but it's covered with fallen logs, so you'll have to deal with that first if you want to utilize the area. In addition, it is kind of a decent walk away from your farmhouse. This farm is completely surrounded by the ocean, allowing you to fish for saltwater fish, which is a feature unique to this farm. And it also has a more specific breakdown of what you can catch. 52% of the time you'll catch an ocean fish, 5.1% of the time you'll catch crab pot fish, another feature unique to this farm, 15% of the time you'll get seaweed, and the rest of the 27% will be trash. Which isn't that bad as far as farm fishing goes. And of course you can use crab pots as well. On the beach, you can find beach forageables such as coral, seaweed, and some of the ocean crab pot fish. Or if you're lucky, you can find supply crates. What these supply crates contain is dependent on how many times you've upgraded your house, giving better items with each upgrade. And the items you get are surprisingly good, from bombs and geodes to retaining soil and triple shot espresso, a lot of what most people consider the most useful items in the game. Over near the bottom left of the farm, you'll find a huge grassy area where you can find forageables. It's not unique spawns like morels like the forest farm has, but it will spawn what Cindersap Forest can spawn. And it's a neat little bonus. And the small pond in the center of the area just gives you trash if you fish in it. Now there is one bonus that the beach farm gets that no other farm gets. There's a secret path here in the bottom left that leads out to this small piece of land. And if you fish here, you can fish up the boat painting. This is the only piece of furniture in the game that is unique to a farm map. There is no other way to get it in the entire game. As you can see, this farm has tons of upsides with just one major downside of not being able to use sprinklers on the sand. The thing is, I don't really think it matters that much. In the same update that added this farm, you get access to a second farm later down the line with plenty of regular farming space. And until then, you won't need much more than the 202 farming spaces that are provided to you on this farm. 
unless you're just a really serious farmer. I find the sheer amount of space and nice aesthetics of the farm more than worth it, and I think it gets a bad rap as a challenge farm. So to cap us off, first of all, I want to say that absolutely no farm is unusable. They all have fun, unique features and at least enough farming space to get you going. And second of all, I would like to show you the results of a poll that I ran using YouTube posts. My question was which farm everyone uses for what they consider their main farm. And altogether, I got 95,900 votes total. The standard farm got 44,660 votes, which is 46.6% of all votes. As expected, most people use the standard farm since it is the default choice, and I'm sure a lot of new players figure it's the proper way to start. In second place was the forest farm with 23,870 votes, which is just below 25%. Understandable, as it has a crazy the amount of extra features that none of the other farms get. I also realize that I think Vincent wants to be on this swing and I'm completely blocking him. Third place, to my surprise, was the Four Corners farm with 10,920 votes or about 11.4% of the votes. It does have a little bit of everything, alongside what I mentioned earlier of it being the only map that was designed for multiplayer. The rest of the farms had a much smaller amount of votes than the first three farms. In fourth place was the Riverland farm, which I didn't expect to beat the beach farm, at 5,390 votes, or 5.6% of the vote. With how much I hear players not liking fishing, I really didn't expect it to beat the beach farm. The beach farm comes barely below it at 5,040 votes, or 5.3%. 3%. Once again, I do think it just got a bad rap of being an air quotes challenge farm, despite having so many huge benefits that make it worth it. The hilltop farm comes second to last with only 3,850 votes, or 4%. There's really no surprise here, but what does surprise me is the Wilderness Farm coming in absolute last, with only 2,940 votes, only 3% of the total votes. My guess is that if anyone made a farm before 1.5 released, monsters on your farm isn't the most appealing feature. But after 1.5, it still gets shafted because it has no unique features, and the standard farm gets chosen instead. I think it's underrated. So now I'm hoping that you have a newfound appreciation for farms that you may have previously wrote off, or you'll have an easier time picking out what farm you'd like to start with. I don't see people talking about the different farms nowadays because it's kind of just become assumed knowledge, but I thought it'd be best to have a video for it anyway. Thank you for watching, see you in the next one, and good night.